Hello. Hi. Hey, everybody. Well, this is just about the end of WordCamp Europe 2024, day one, Friday. How's everybody feeling? Um, what the heck? This is like the most response out of the entire afternoon. Is that because we're getting ready to go to parties? Aunt, you're going to some parties? Yes. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, well, I hope to see you guys all there. But for now, we still got a great session lined up for you all. But before that, we're going to have some announcements. And let me get to my announcements. So who's visited the sponsor hall? OK, I'm, I'm assuming no one is just interacting with me, because you should have visited the sponsor hall. It's just down the hall. Uh, make sure you do visit them. We wouldn't be here without sponsors. WordCamps heavily uh, rely on sponsorships, so go take swag. They don't want to take any of it home. On that note as well, go get your WordCamp Europe swag right here at the information desk in the middle. And then as well, um, if you need any help, look for any volunteers or organizers. Volunteers have gray shirts. Organizers have black shirts. Okay. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. We're going to bring up our final speaker for this track, and that is Ryan Ritzfeld. <laughs> okay, okay, real, real, okay. And uh, Ryan is a web accessibility specialist from the Netherlands. As a freelance accessibility consultant, she works for NL Design System, the WordPress agency Level Level, and the form plugin Gravity Forms. She also teaches at the online learning platform, the Alley Collective. She loves to share her knowledge on WordCamps, meetups, workshops, and accessibility conferences worldwide. When not writing, reviewing, or teaching, you can find Ryan working in her garden. Come on up. Thank you all for showing up. Wow. Thank you for such a difficult topic as legislation. And then it should work sometimes. OK. My name is Rian Rietveld. <laughs> I'm a web uh, accessibility specialist from the Netherlands. I'm a freelance consultant for at NL Design System. And for Level Level, they over there, yeah. <laughs> and for Gravity Forms. And I'm also a teacher at the Ellie Collective, and that's an online learning platform for web accessibility. They have a boot, so check them out. All slides and links are available at rianrietveld.com backward slash WCEU24. I will repeat that slide at, uh, at the la uh, that URL at the last slide. So, in this talk, I'm going to give you a brief history lesson about European legislation on web accessibility, how to comply to the European Accessibility Act, how to prepare for it, what not to do. I will give you a talk about a use case, about a company that really tackled that well, and I'll give you some final thoughts. So I don't know why my clicker doesn't work. Okay. One disclaimer. I am not a lawyer. I am an accessibility expert. I can tell you in my point of view what will the best practice for you to comply to the European Accessibility Act but if you really want to know in your use case what's the best approach, uh, uh, contact your legal team or hire a lawyer that is specialized in accessibility legislation. So please don't sue me. Okay. A brief history lesson. We start in 2016. The EU member states agreed on a directive 2016-2102, and these are accessibility requirements for websites and mobile apps for public sector bodies. That's for government websites. Most countries already has le have legislation for that, 
like the US, the UK, most member states, uh, Japan, Australia. But now the EU actually agreed on that directive that they will implement accessibility um, in their legislation, all member states from the EU. Then, in 2019, the member states agreed on the directive 2019-882, accessibility requirements for products and services. So that's much broader. And this directive is known as the European Accessibility Act, and that's what we are talking about. What are products? So quite a bit. Computers and operating systems, this is all hardware, should be accessible. Smartphone, smartphones and other communication devices, TV equipment, ATMs, e-readers, ticketing and check-in machines, they all need to be accessible for people with a disability. Services. Phone and banking services. If you want to do a payment, that whole process must be accessible. E-commerce, websites, mobile services, electronic ticketing, e-books, access to audiovisual media, calls to the European Emergency Number 112. All these services must be accessible for people with a disability. I emphasized e-commerce, websites and mobile services because that's what we do as WordPress community. We build websites and mobile services. We do e-commerce. All those services need to be accessible. June 28, 2022. All member states must have implemented this legislation, this agreement, into their own legislation, into their laws. Well, it's the EU, EU, and not every country is that fast. The Netherlands only implemented this legislation two months ago. Some states even implemented it at all yet. Some are really ready and have thought everything really well out. It depends per member state. And in June, June 28, 2025, that is one year from now, the legislation will be enforced. How? Nobody knows. I'll talk about that later. Not all member states have figured it out yet. How to comply to the European Accessibility Act? Well, first, who needs to comply? Companies that sell services and our products. I think all the sponsors in the sponsor list sell products or services. So their websites probably need to be accessible. Are they? Okay. There are exceptions. If you are a really small company um, and you don't have much revenue, you don't need to comply. But maybe that will be too heavy burden for you. Companies with less than 10 employees and a global turnover of less than 2 million euros don't need to comply. And also, if you don't sell services or products, you also don't need to comply. You can, you probably need to, but it's very good for your revenue, but that's another talk. What, what do you need to comply to? What are the, the rules? There is a UN norm, the EN 301-549. There's even a song about that. And that's the European Standard for Digital Accessibility. And it specifies requirements for information and communication technolo technology to be accessible for people with disabilities. That's huge. That's broad. That also... Um, um, addresses the products and the services, everything. It also addresses the government services and uh, products. So it's very broad. But what about websites? What does it say about websites? Thankfully, it mentions the web accessibility guidelines. 
and the part of EN 305549 that covers web accessibility is actually WCAG level AA version 2.1. And that's what we use anyway for accessible websites. Pew. One difference. There is, an addict, um, the, uh, is additive sections in the European standard for electronic documents. So if you publish uh, PDFs on your website, for example, they need to be accessible too. So that's a good reason to get rid of your PDFs. But that's another talk. Okay. <laughs> yeah. A few questions I get a lot. My company is based outside of the EU. Do I need to comply? Yes. If you sell services or products to the EU, you need to comply to that standard. WCAG 2.1 AA. Note, if you uh, create software for the US government, you need to comply to section 508. And that's WCAG 2.0. There's a previous version of WCAG. So the EU is stricter than the US government. Take that into account. Will there be consequences? Yes. How depends on the member states' legislation? Maybe. Um, this is something we don't know yet. But there are signs. In Spain, the Spanish airline, Berlin, if I pronounce that well, got fined 90,000 euros because their website isn't accessible. 90,000 euros is one thing, but the sentence also prohibits the airline to receive public funds for a period of six months. So that's severe punishment for an airline. Another sign, and that really went viral within the accessibility um, community, Ireland. Penalties for breaching requirements may include a fine up to 5,000 euros and or imprisonment for up to six months for a case of summary conviction and a fine up to 60,000 euros and or imprisonment up to 18 months in case of an indictive conviction. Right. My fantasy goes wild here. Okay. <laughs> okay. How do I prove that my website is accessible? Refer to a recent independent audit. Let an accessibility company audit your website. How accessible is it? and they can provide you with a report and you can refer to that on your website in an accessible statement, I will accessibility statement. I will talk more about that later. So how do you prepare? Aim for WCAG 2.2 AA for websites that a pretty safe assumption at the moment. 2.2 is the latest version of uh, WCAG that is released in October last year. Then you are a bit sustainable for the future. More and more EU countries adopt 2.2 in their own legislation, so 2.1 is like the global standard, aim for 2.2. And a brief update on WCAG. This is the WCAG Quick Ref, and it gives you a list of all the guidelines, web accessibility content guidelines, and to meet each guideline, you have a series of success criteria. You have to meet a success criteria to meet a guideline. Success criteria are ways to measure if you meet a guideline. For example, there is one guideline, text alternatives. Provide text alternatives for non-content. And there is a success criteria. All non-text content that is presented to the user has a text alternative. For example, if you have an image that tells a story that gives meaning to content, that image must have an alternative text. If images have alternative text, 
then you have a pass for that success criteria. How many success criteria are there? Quite a lot. You have three different levels. A is basic accessibility, double A is the global standard, and triple A is all the success criteria, and that's really for dedicated software. If you meet double A, that's 31 success criteria, double A is 55, that is A plus 24 extra, and triple A is everything that's 86. 68, 68, yeah, okay. If you start working on making an accessibility overhaul, let someone provide an audit for you as a basement measurement. Where am I now? What are the issues? If you um, let that do a door uh, by a, a good agency, they provide you, except from the real audit, also with recommendations, how to fix and best practice, how to fix things uh, that are very useful for people with accessibility, but maybe not covered by WCAG. Then you have a baseline. Then you make a plan how to fix in a sustainable way that with each um, fix or each new feature, the accessibility doesn't break again. And in this stage, it's very important to get help from a professional too that can guide you through the process. What's the most important? What's the most severe? What can we do later? Make a plan together with a professional. Train your team. Please do. Don't create something, throw it over the fence to uh, an accessibility expert and see, okay, uh, this is what we did, fix it. That doesn't work. You have to include accessibility from the start. So all people in, um, that are um, in the project, in your team, must know from their part what they need to do to create accessible content, to create an accessible website. UXers, designers, developers, content creators, managers, but also the CEO, the people who can uh, manage the budget, because you need budget to train your people, uh, money and maybe time, to get everybody on board and to get everybody at the right knowledge. Then work on the issues, one by one, as a team. And maybe you have to rethink your work. If you have a table, and that's really important to you, a table, and that's very complex, and it has a horizontal scroll bar and a vertical scroll bar and uh, lots of lots of data, that's a hell to make accessible. But maybe it's also way too complicated for other people, for all people, to understand. Break the table up up in, for example, three different tables. Maybe you have to repeat some information, but it way it's much more accessible for people who are blind, but maybe for all people to perceive the information. So you have to rethink, do we really need that slider? Do we really need that co in complicated uh, tabular interface? Is it no, simplicity is uh, for everybody a better Then integrate accessibility in your workflow. Each step you take, you test. UX, the design, um, the code, the content. Each step has to be accessible before it can go further. It's normal that you integrate performance, security, and responsiveness in your quality. This is what you offer to your client. Accessibility belongs there too. It's part of the quality of your work. Your website has a great performance, is secure, is responsive, and is accessible. That should be just what you deliver. And then provide an accessibility statement. Tell your clients that you work on accessibility. What are you aiming for? WCAG, AA, version 2.2. What needs to be done? What is the roadmap? And how can someone report an issue? Now I know that if you state what needs to be done on a website in the US, 
then a lawyer says, okay, this I can sue you for, that I can sue you for, that I can sue you for. So and that's the reason why in US government, uh, US website, in the accessibility statement, never is mentioned what is wrong. Only what they're aiming for and how you can ask for help. What you do here, talk with this, uh, about this with your lawyer, with your legal team. Um, in the Europe, uh, in the Netherlands, um, for a government website, it's required to have a link to an audit and to state what is wrong and what needs to be done and uh, when you're going to fix it. So it also depends on the legislation. But I think it's good if you tell to your audience, to your, your clients, okay, I'm really working on it. It's not perfect yet and we're trying to fix it. That uh, that is the date when we think it will be done. And if you have a complaint or an issue, please tell us. And take complaints seriously. This is super important. Someone with a disability doesn't know how to use your website, has an issue with your website. It's a client who wants to use your website, buy your product and has an issue. Help them. They have the courtesy to uh, report an issue. Have a ticket system in place. So that people um, uh, can report issues and that you assign people to address them. You get all kinds of different uh, accessibility issues. Some are uh, real issues. Other issues are that people really don't understand where they are looking for and maybe you can guide them and then think maybe the UX should be uh, uh, different. Or sometimes people run uh, your website through an accessibility checker and get a false positive. Check that and maybe report that false positive to the accessibility checker. But if you really take complaints seriously, that will uh, save you a lot of trouble because then you don't get angry customers. What not to do? There is no quick fix. There are products that claim to use artificial intelligence to meet WCAG for you just by adding a widget on their site, on your site. They are generally called accessibility overlays. You cannot turn an inaccessible website into an accessible one by just adding a few lines of JavaScript. If you want to know more about this, oh, go to overlayfactsheet.com. Um, there is a list of all the overlay companies, an explanation of what overlays are, um, reviews of many people who are uh, disabled, how they experience overlays, and a petition that is signed by more than 800 accessibility experts world worldwide. If you want to know more, um, check out this website. Also, see an in-depth coverage of Adrian Rosselli's 2022 WordPress Accessibility Day talk, Overlays Under Realm. Adrian Rosselli is a world-renowned accessibility expert. He does thoroughly research on overlays and on assistive technology. Um, he publishes his research and he tweeted about it and then gets sued by an overlay company for publishing his research and for his opinion about it. Um, that was a really hard time for it. But I want to thank him for all his effort and for publishing his research. And um, Adrian, you are a hero. Yeah. That was for you, yeah? Okay. Now for the good news. A use case, gravity forms. Um, Graphitic Forms went through all the process from um, what we are aiming for until an accessible end result. And it was all a team effort. 
the team of Gravity Forms is really motivated to get an accessible end result. So they set a goal, and that was in 2018. So that was even before there was a talk about the European Accessibility Act. They wanted to comply with WCAG AA 2.1 at the moment. Um, they did an initial audit and then trained the team. All the issues were put into GitHub issues and they went through the issues one by one. They wrote extensive documentation on their websites for people who use the plugin and want to install the plugin, on for designers, content creators, for developers, but also a checklist how to implement a form to make it accessible. They have an accessible statement on their website and accessibility is being maintained. So that's really great. And they're super proud of it. So tell it to the world. On WordCamp Europe 2021, I gave a talk together with Morgan Kay. She is one of the lead developers, enhancing the accessibility of a plugin a use case. It's the link is in the slide. Okay. Some final thoughts. What are we going to do? All these different legislations, all these different countries, and uh, what do I do if I um, don't want to get sued by a EU state? How does that work? I cannot. I cannot look in the future. I don't know. So, um, in the standard, it says stick to WCAG 2.1 AA. And if some of countries are stricter than that, do you need to be better than the standard? Is there one country that has super, super strict um, regulations? Do you need to improve your work to that super, super strict regulation? If you aim for WCAG 2.2 AA, then you're, and you reach that point, you're already better than 99.9 .9 of all websites worldwide. So I think you're pretty safe. I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, okay. What I want to say is create a web that's usable for everyone. User test. Also with people that use the web in a different way than you do. I want to dedicate this talk to my parents. This is them 60 years ago. Are they lovely? <laughs> my father, a young lieutenant from the Royal Dutch Air Force, and my mother, a secretary. Uh, she made her own wedding dress. They were very smart and also uh, very tech savvy. My father was an aviation um, technician. He worked on the Meteor, on the F-16, a long time. And um, they really got te technology. And they really went well with the web. They were the first generation who were using computers and using the web. It went all well. My mother was a secretary, and she introduced the word processor on her office, and later uh, Word Perfect and Word. And she taught everyone in the office how to use it. But about 10 years ago, that went wrong. This is them four years ago. Um, my mother got angry at bad UX. Things had changed. She couldn't understand the interface anymore. And why is it so hard to get a telephone number from a website? She couldn't understand wh where to find the information or how to order anymore. My father got Parkinson's disease. So he had a tremor and he couldn't really use the mouse anymore. And learning keyboard accessibility when you're 80 is really not an option. So he tried to use the mouse and some menus when you have like three layers. It's very hard to operate. So I think we failed them. And they blame themselves. I cannot use it. Why can I not understand it? People blame themselves. So let's help all people to feel they are welcome and capable. Because nobody is perfect, so don't create for perfect people only. Use us first. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we left time for lots of questions. Oh, and we already got one lined up, so yep, take it away. Hi, Rian. Hi. Thanks for your talk. I was wondering, do you have more information about regulations in different countries? Like you were mentioning WCAG, and you said some states are a bit more strict. Yeah, I know Germany has some extra uh, regulations. Yeah. Um, there are, um, in the websites, the URLs there, uh, some links to different legislation in different countries. So, uh, if you want to check that out, if you specifically target, for example, Germany, Germany has very strict accessibility regulations that go beyond WCAG. So, uh, there is a list on the site. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, yep. Yeah. Hi, Rian. Fantastic Hi, talk. Thank you so much for Thank bringing you. this very important subject in a very timely way. On a larger project, it's often the case that... Wow. Is that me? It's often the case that uh, accessibility is being addressed by some design teams and some development teams and maybe some hosting teams as well or, or some different stakeholders. Do you think there's an ideal place for, for accessibility to be owned in... Well, yeah. Is, uh, is there an ideal role to own accessibility in a complicated build process? I think it's good if you have a larger company that you have an accessibility team or an accessibility expert. Yeah, maybe it's that, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think um, if you have uh, someone in your company that knows accessibility and can monitor it and can do the reviews, that will be really reassuring or um, is that something you, uh, you had in mind? Or well, I was wondering if you go, it's a design thing or it's a technical thing, or maybe it's a product ownership thing. Yeah. That was the thing that sort of sprang to mind, product ownership is a good place for it to live? Where it is to live, I think it should live in each uh, part. Yeah. Um, and um, each part you develop, that should be checked by the people who are knowledging about that kind of part. Uh, and that's why it's training is so important. But an overview, um, the, uh, someone who is having an overview, I don't know which role that should be because I'm not that really into how a, a company is organized. Um, but I think um, having an accessibility expert or hiring an accessibility expert who monitoring the whole process is okay. But each team is responsible for their own work. So if a designer sees, uh, uh, delivers something to the development and uh, the color counters is okay, that shouldn't be happening. And also, if the developer sees that, he should correct the designer. So everybody is responsible for their own part of work. And then an accessibility consultant can be uh, can have an overview and look also at the end result. And you can discuss uh, like edge cases with them. Yeah, I, I don't know how that should be in the hierarchical structure of a company. That's okay. Thank <laughs> yeah. you very much. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I have a question about backend accessibility because I have a client who uses a screen reader. Uh, do you know of any way, like any resource directory lists, um, where you can find out if a plugin is accessible in the backend too? Or any tips for that? Well, it's like in the admin? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know Graffiti Forms does work on that. Well, that's the form plugin, but there's not like a plugin, let's fix the admin for accessibility, and you install that plugin and the admin is accessible. That doesn't exist. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry. <laughs> it depends, it's a, the, the responsible of the accessibility team, of, of not, it's not the response, it's responsible of the people who develop um, the admin, and it's f the responsible of the uh, plugin owner or development team to make their work respons uh, accessible, yeah. So there's no quick fix, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, thank you very much for your talk. So I actually represent an agency that works a lot on implementing accessibility for our clients. And one of the biggest issues that we encounter from audits that we receive from third party companies is ambiguity on a lot of criteria. So different auditors even within the same company, sometimes interpret criteria differently. Yeah. Sometimes they say you pass a criteria, sometimes you don't pass a criteria. Yeah. So I wonder how that's going to be implemented in the legislation because let's say 
uh, if you've received an audit, a report, and the company said you're accessible, partially accessible, and gives you a percentage, and then, for example, a certain other third party is going to repass your website and say, okay, we're not, you're not accessible in these criteria. How do you think, in your opinion, uh, that's going to be interpreted? That's a good question, because uh, auditing is done by humans. And uh, there are errors, but also different ways people interpret the web content accessibility guidelines. In the Netherlands, we have a special, um, uh, uh, we united as accessibility specialists together to meet and to discuss about these issues. This is what we do. Uh, this is how we um, 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 decide on what is accessible or what fails or what not fails not. And I think there's also a global uh, discussion forum between accessibility experts about what do you, how do you audit stuff. But it stays work from a human, so it can differ. Um, well, um, uh, get a second opinion maybe? I don't know. If there's an audit and you say, okay, this is not a really good audit, maybe you should hire a better auditing team. Um, there are very cheap or uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to blame a shame. Okay, yeah. My question was more in terms yeah, of I, legislation because, yeah. uh, for example, you mentioned Ireland that they're going to have fines and you know. Well, that's in the late stage. Yeah, well, you can also say when um, uh, it's not from the audit, but it, um, yeah, I, I don't know really an answer to that. Um, um, you cannot get fined only because of an audit. You get fined if you don't take action, if you don't fix things. And if you have um, uh, maybe issues in the audit, you can research that and maybe fix it or fi don't fix it. Um, I, I don't think it has to do with legislation. It just has to do with, okay, this is the audit and how do I respond to it? Do I fix it or not? Uh, I don't have a real good answer for that. I am not a lawyer. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. yeah. Thank you. My name is Toby. Uh, my question touches a little bit with the question we had a little bit earlier. Are you aware of any frameworks being developed on that would help uh, a content creator to do some pre-publishing checks? perhaps so that the company, when they know what kind of things they are dealing with, they could make a list that you need to check off yeah, these there are, there before is a work, you publish. There, there is a WordPress plugin for that. Um, yeah, you could, um, I have no know the name, by digital, what's a, what's a WordPress plugin by Amber Hurst? Yes. Oh, Amber, <laughs> go talk to Amber. <laughs> they have a plugin, and then uh, that checks your website for you, and that's a WordPress plugin for accessibility issues. Um, okay. Um, well, the best thing is always go for a good theme. Of course. Yeah. I mean, a good theme, and also, as you say, you need to first analyze yeah, what you are uh, doing and everything. Yeah, and, and train your contact team that yeah. also that content is accessible. And then you yeah. know what to look for. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Hello, my Hi. name is Bjarne, and Hi. I have been working with uh, accessible websites for quite some years now. Okay. And this is more like an advice than a question. And it is to get in touch with your theme developer or your plugin developer if you encounter an accessibility issue in yeah. uh, the theme or the plugin because many of these themes are used by tens and thousands of people, and it is my experience that these uh, developers are always interested in fixing these errors. So by reporting them, you can get uh, these uh, products uh, to work a lot better for a lot of people. On the other hand, then you're doing free work for them. Then you're auditing them their work. Maybe you should, <laughs> it, it's like a 50-50. Like you can say, oh, this and this and this is all wrong on your website or your plugin. And then you're doing a free audit for them. You all can say, well, maybe you should hire an accessibility expert to actually look into your website because I saw many accessibility issues. If it's a small issue, maybe that's something to do. But don't do a whole review on a website for free. That's an interesting point. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> 
And we do time. have time for a couple more questions. If anyone would like to step up. Hi, I'm Henry from the Internet Society. Hi. I work as a developer. When you audit a website on its accessibility, I usually use a tool called WebAIM Wave. And once I have fixed all the issues at the theme level or in the content, I usually validate once more with a screen reader. Yeah. Can you confirm that this strategy is valid, that this seems to be the way to go? Well, uh, automatic testing like uh, um, uh, Wave or um, X DevTools don't get any, all the accessibilities out. So it gives a good indication. But other tools of other issues they cannot detect, like keyboard accessibility or like um, if uh, there, is, there are good ex um, old text on images, if they only can detect that there is an old text, but they cannot detect if the old text really describes the image. So going through it with a screen reader is actually a good thing because you will then you get the experience if text makes sense and if the order is logical. So it's a combination of uh, using automated testing, keyboard testing, going through it with a screen reader and with your eyes, just go through the website and see if the order makes sense, if the proximity is okay, if everything that belongs together is put together. Um, so it's a combination. But a web, uh, Wave and, and X web tools are great tools for getting uh, a lot of issues out. No? Oh. Oh. <laughs> so my next point would be, in fact, this is a huge job to get a website valid. Um, and here, uh, I want to mention that it's not easy to convince management of a company that we have, we need a, a special position. That's, that's why I'm super happy with this new law. Because now it's the law. You have to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I'm also very curious if this will uh, be the same as the GDPR when uh, suddenly one month before, before everybody needed to have like a security on the website, like, pri like privacy, then everybody just put a cookie banner on it and uh, a, a cookie wall on it. You cannot enter before you consent to the cookies. And that kind of died out. So maybe um, what I'm afraid of, that people uh, just put an overlay on the website and think I'm okay. And that isn't the case. So that's why I mentioned overlays. Any more questions? Here. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about two versions of the website? So I like to make fancy websites, but uh, for the uh, accessibility, I want to make the same page uh, in other version. So okay, so you have the website for blind people, for deaf people, for no, people no, who are accessi accessible website and fancy website. Accessible sites and fancy versions. You can make very fancy websites accessible. I should advise against two different websites. That's two different websites you need to maintain. And accessibility is such a broad uh, a spectrum from people who are colorblind who cannot see color very well up to people who cannot read very well uh, or people who are dyslectic or people who really need keyboard accessibility. It's so different, like this accessible website and then your fancy website. I think that's double work and also an insult to the people who, uh, this is the website for blind people. And then you have to go to the website for blind people. I think that's an insult. Take no. the extra step. Okay. okay. But I meant that in uh, every browser has this uh, reader uh, option. So if yeah. you click on the reader, you will only see the text. Yeah. So I use that a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I but meant that it's not that a replacement way. because uh, the website needs to be built in a structured way. It, it, the reader view doesn't always work on every page. Mm -hmm. Maybe only on, on like a blog post or a large article page. And it gives and doesn't give all the information, so it's not really uh, a good replacement, but it's an extra aid. 
because I use it a lot. If there's a lot of advertisement, a lot of distraction, read a few gives an absolute brilliant way to read through the text. But it, uh, it, it doesn't work on every page. So it's an ad. It, it can help you, but it's not a replacement. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, last question. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, Thorsten. <laughs> Hi, Rian. Thank you for the talk. Uh, um, I was wondering, I'm, I'm from Germany, and you said there are so strict rules in Germany. Yeah. But from my perspective, um, if a company or a, um, in my case, a government's uh, website, um, need to follow these rules now. Yeah. Because uh, for government websites, this is uh, true um, even before this European yeah. Act. So um, if you have rules, you need to have sanctions. And you, if you don't uh, have someone who's complaining about it, then nothing happens. So OK, now we have the rules, but we need to, to sue companies uh, which are not following. And I'm not sure about if this works. So any well, ideas? I, I, I cannot look in the future, so yeah, you're, I, I cannot too. Um, maybe that, um, yeah, can you <laughs> join in? <laughs> Hi. So in Germany currently for the government project or for the government website, um, every state has a different, like has their own um, person to look at this. So if you have a complaint in the state of accessibility, the address and the contact information have to be in there. So if you have a complaint and you can't solve it with the website itself, you can tell them and they will solve it for you. Oh, right. Well, in the Netherlands, we actually have like a, a register with all the government le website listed, and that's a, a blame and shame. Some, uh, and then you have A, then you're accessible, and D, and then, or E, then you didn't have done audit and you're not uh, working on accessible, accessibility and all. Thus you can blame and shame government websites that way and force them into accessibility. How that will, that will be done with companies, I have no idea. Yeah, so I cannot look in the future. I think it will be like a hot mess. Uh, of uncertainty and, and uh, people suing and don't know the law and but maybe uh, it will be a good motivation for companies to actually spend money for accessibility. Okay. Thank you. Yay.